Okay, so this is the Alex problem. This is what we would call from our textbook, uh, a method of initial rates problem. They call it an initial reaction rate data. It's the same thing as we're gonna do in lab anyway. So one thing to point out here is with the, um, the ratios between different runs. So for me, I would take this data and I would write it down on actual paper. And I would call this like reaction one, reaction two, reaction three. So that's how I'm gonna refer to those. And so just kind of looking at them, I can see like that number one and three have the same concentration of N2. And uh, I guess two and one have the same concentration of H2. So the studies are always designed that way so that when we make our ratios in the method of initial rates, they'll cancel out. Okay, so what I mean by that, I'm gonna expand on this and then we'll look at where you got to on your, on your page. <clears throat> if we took the rate of reaction one and divided it by the rate of reaction two, we'll get that ratio. You got there already. What it really means though is K from reaction one times whatever the concentration of N2 is, which is 0.723, raised to some power we don't know yet. That's kind of what we're trying to figure out. And then um, 1.38 raised to the Y. That's a Y, obviously. <laughs> I better make that look better. It's like a triangle. There. And then on the bottom, when we say rate two, it means it equals the K2. And we're gonna do 2.64 raised to the X, and we're gonna do 1.38 raised to the Y. So when we write it like that, when we take the time to write it out, um, a couple things happen. First off, the Ks are supposed to cancel. And we also see that your Y terms cancel. So what this boils down to is whatever rate one is divided by rate two. So here that's gonna be the 97.0 divided by 1.29. That's a negative, that's a negative positive three actually. It looks like a heart that I did sideways. I don't know, sometimes it works. <laughs> There, it's a little bit better. So rate one is 97, rate two is the 1.29. I don't know why that looks terrible, but it does there. Um, so we've substituted those variables in for the actual numbers. We can't really, other than crossing stuff off, we can't really simplify the right-hand side very much though, okay? So this is where we get to if we chose reaction one and two, we're solving for X because that's the variable that doesn't cross off. And here X is defined as the variable in terms of N2 and I defined Y as H2. It doesn't matter really, right? Just as long as you know what the X and Y are and I can kind of follow you. So if you wanna switch your screen to show me your work there, we can find where you've got that basic structure. I think it's the first one. Oh, sure. So you just flipped it. So I'll rewrite it. So uh, that's it's kind of what I was unsure about too, because the way it shows in Alex is to do. It doesn't it, matter. It's sucky. Okay, as long as it doesn't matter. <laughs> but what does matter is that you still have this exponent there and that's the piece missing. Okay. The reason Alex says to flip it is because it's telling you to put the bigger rate on top. It just keeps you from making simple math errors later, but you can do it either way, it doesn't matter. Okay. You'll get to the same answer one way or another. Understood. So here we have, um, hold on. I'm reminded. Okay. So here we have a ratio still with an exponential variable in there. So we have to deal with that. And this is the step that I think was missing on each of these. So I'm gonna walk you through that. I'm gonna do that as a, um, on a whiteboard where we have more room. Okay. Maybe I will. Uh, 
Okay, yeah, so. I'm also going to share this before, or I mean, I'm save this just in case we need to refer. Okay, so we're going to open up the whiteboards. So we got more space. When I do kinetics problems, it takes me like two pages. So we left off here. Where we still don't know what the, the exponent is. We did know that this part is here, so. Okay. So I can simplify the right. That's just putting it into my calculator. Oh, that reminds me. Um, I have two different calculators here. Actually, I have three. Because um, this came up in Discord the other day, and I think it's important for everybody to know. I don't have any Casio. Um, <laughs> I don't have any Casio calculators because I think they are not designed for us. They're designed for accounting. But you had, I think, an 84. Yep. So what I was talking about, I should get a document camera, but I don't have one. Focus. OK, well, that says EE -E right above. There we go. Yep. So here's my number pad. The comma has an EE button. So to get to that functionality, you push this very well loved second button. <laughs> and so the way like that I would enter this number, I already forgot, 1.29. I'm gonna put it on my calculator the way it should look. It'll focus eventually. Maybe do it. <laughs> I don't know, this is supposed to be a fancy camera, but it just doesn't always do what I want. Go. Yeah, I feel like right there, it's a little bit blurry, but you can kind of get the gist. Hmm. I'll write it on the whiteboard as well, the way that it actually looks. Um, I think the TI instruments are the easiest to use for exponential notation. So the way that you enter this is kind of like how you were doing it in Excel last semester. I pushed um, so this E button on the TI-84, you have to go the second button and then you push the comma button, which says EE -E in light blue or whatever color your second button is colored. This EE -E button stands for the times 10 part of it. So all you have to enter after that is the three. And so we're gonna we're gonna be running into so much scientific notation in the semester. It's important to get that under. You can also use the caret button, which is the one that looks like this. In that case, you'd write it like this. The problem with doing it this way is if you don't use parentheses around this entire thing, when we go to divide exponential notation, it will do it wrong on your calculator. So. So there's actually the Alex thing that I was talking about yesterday uh, had to do with undoing the log, which I ended that's, up doing anyways. It was an e, it's ex on the TI-84, but that's what I was struggling with. Okay, yeah, that's not an exponential notation one. And that is different on each model of the TI-84. So for mm -hmm. this particular model, it's the same as my LN button. So they're opposites. LN and E to the X are opposites. They're focused. I also have I also have a log base 10 button if I'm using LOG instead of LN because we can choose either one. And that's actually the piece that, that is missing from this equation. So I'm just gonna simplify the right hand side and then we'll use the logs to simplify the left. So on the right hand side, I come up with 13.29896907. I'm going to, I've only got three sick things, so I'll keep four. Mm, I just changed my mind. I'm going to keep five because the four would be weird. <laughs> and so on the left hand side, the only thing I can simplify here algebraically is I can pull out the exponent and make the fraction inside some fraction, inside some parentheses there. So anyways, I, I can pull out an exponent because these are like terms, right? So it's the same x in both of them. That's why we do that. 
So I can also simplify inside of those parentheses just to kind of make it simpler for me to follow the math. That's a six. Rewrite that. Again, I'll keep one extra figure or so just to, so I don't mess up my math. When we round, I know we're going to use logarithms because it's the only way to solve for a variable exponent. Uh, we don't want to round too soon because logarithms will amplify any error exponentially because they're exponential functions. So then when we get to this point, this is the key thing to do, and it's going to happen in every method of initial rates problem. You can use the log or the ln function. Either one works fine, but you do it to both sides. So on the left, this simplifies the log of an exponent brings your exponent down into the front. So we're bringing that down as a coefficient. And then now we just have the logarithm of two numbers. So I, I'm just going to simplify it this way. You could solve them and then divide. It doesn't matter. I'm getting kind of sideways here. So that's the log of 13.299 and the log of 3.651. And so I'll just bunch them in the calculator like that. And in actuality, what I do is I put log in and then I go back up to the 13 with all the different sig figs because I have a graphing calculator, so it's already there. And then divided by the ln of the 3.651, all of that. And so what we find out, I'm going to come over here now, is x equals 1.99802 bunches of other numbers, OK? So um, these x's are always whole numbers, so our last step is just to round to the nearest whole number, which is 2. So you got this part down. You figured out which ratios to make to solve for the variable. But what you're missing is you need to have that x value as an exponent. And the only way to get rid of that is to do the logarithm here. Okay. So when you get to that point, when I so when I'm actually like writing it down, <clears throat> my sheet that I was already on, of course I lost it. <laughs> um, so the it, so if the rate is ninety seven point four, then what would I put as the? So oh, I think maybe the vocab is stumbling a little bit. So. The question is asking you for a rate law. So a rate law means you're going to have the word rate, and then it's going to have whatever the constant is. In this case, we just solved for x, which we defined as n2. Oops, mm -hmm. oops. This kind of bracket. So that means concentration of n2 raised to the x and concentration of h2 raised to the y. This is the, I sort of skipped over it earlier. Maybe shouldn't have because this is what you're trying to solve for. You need to have values for x and y. And sometimes they'll ask you to solve for k to find a rate law. Yeah, so that's actually what it is asking me to do. And then I get k right, but I can't get the units right. <laughs> So every single time it'll be, you know what I mean, mole times seconds, but each time it's it's a different exponent. So it'll be like moles to the negative three times seconds to the negative one. And I have no clue what's supposed to go there. I see the problem. So you have to you have to solve I'm gonna get an alert again. That's the last one for the next two hours. Um, so you have to solve X and Y to get the units correct on a rate law. So we just found out that x is 2. So we'll put that in there. You have to do the same thing to find y. I don't know what it is, but let's make up one, and I'll walk you through the units. Let's pretend. I'm not saying this is right, but let's pretend like it's a 1. You'd have to go through the same process, but um, use the reactions 1 and 3 so you can cancel n2 and solve for h2. Same okay. process though. I'm gonna pretend like we just did that and we got a one, okay? Mm -hmm. So now what I'll do to solve for K is I'll put in the information I have for any one of the rates. In this case, I'm just gonna pick the first one. The rate is 97 molarity per second. I'm trying to find K. 
my molarity here N2 is going to be 0 0.723. Oops, I need to write that unit. Hold on. That's molarity squared times the molarity of H2. This is just, again, from the problem, right? So we can't forget to square the number, but we also can't forget to square the unit. They both are part of that. So we end up here, I'm going to do some purple. We end up with molarity squared there, right? Mm -hmm. We end up with molarity here. So altogether, the right-hand side is molarity cubed, right? So if I, if I wanted to divide this, um, let me phrase that differently. It's, I want to make sure that K has units that will cancel out and end up with molarity per second, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to have some kind of seconds in there and we're going to have to do something so that I only have one molarity left on the right side. I'm going to make a new, save this and make a new one. I should have rewritten it to begin with. Okay, so we end up with um, just thinking of the units right now. I think you can do the math, but we end up with molarity cubed from these three and molarity per second on the other side. So the question really is, which units do I need to have in order for them to match on both sides? <laughs> so what's missing? Uh, we don't have seconds on the right side. Yeah. And we want that on the bottom, so that's why I put that on the bottom. What do we have to do so that there's only one molarity on, on the right side? Um, negative two molarity. Yeah, I like to put that in the bottom. But you could also write seconds inverse molarity. Oh, gosh. Negative two. So those mean this and this are equivalent. Okay. <laughs> That's an arrow. Like that. Okay. So if we had this combination of units, then we end up matching molarity per second on the left uh, with our units on the right because they'll cancel. So just okay. break that out like this. All right. So two of these are going to cancel, leaving us one molarity. That cancels completely and the seconds remain. So you end up with understood and then of course the math is kind of the same same you know as algebra right so you're gonna divide and well first exponents then divide yeah I, I knew that there had to be something like looking at the top purple problem I knew there had to be some type of like just easy way to kind of figure it out you know what I mean um so yeah that made everything come full circle <laughs> okay yeah I think sometimes just pulling the numbers away from the problem and looking at the units alone helps yeah in practice, when you have the units for a, a K value, it tells you all about the reaction mechanism. You know which things matter and all of that. So it's helpful. That's why they emphasize it. Understood.